I'm in New York, or, or rather right now I'm in, in Brooklyn, and uh, in a park where people are playing soccer, uh, or as we like to call it, football, uh, here on a, on a Saturday morning. And uh, on my left side there are the most adorable little kids uh, playing, uh, or kicking cones and trying to kick a ball, and it's so adorable. And uh, on my right there are some grown-ups uh, playing and they're actually pretty good for Americans. <laughs> I'm not here to watch football or soccer. I'm, I'm here to meet a friend of mine and uh, even though we've never met, I do call him a friend and he's one of the best podcasters I've, I, I know. His name is Scott Gurian and he does a podcast you've heard me talk about before here on the Radio Vagabond as a podcast recommendation. It's called Far From Home. And we have a lot in common. We've both done uh, radio for many, many years, and we both do uh, a, a travel podcast. And um, I'm here in, in a park in Brooklyn about to meet uh, this guy. Meet Pala Bo, a full-time traveler and digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. This is The Radio Vagabond. Scott just wrote to me that he's a few blocks away, so... While we're waiting for him, let me remind you that this episode is partly supported by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best deals on hotel rooms, guest houses, and hostels, and apartments. Anywhere where you can get a roof over your head in one simple search. It does that by searching a bunch of the biggest hotel search sites in one simple search. Hotels25.com Scott is going to spend his Saturday with me in Brooklyn, Queens and Manhattan, showing me around some interesting places as we chat and get to know each other. We walk over to his car, a nice, big, newer Toyota, and very different from the tiny, older car that played a big part in the first season of his podcast, Far From Home. He lives in nearby Jersey, just across the Hudson River. So today, we're close to home. So, Scott, no, now we're, we're in your car, and uh, I, I'm kind of surprised this is not a Nissan Micra. <laughs> no, it's not. I, uh, I, I think I got sick and tired of driving a Nissan Micra after driving across Europe and Asia, so... Uh, no more Nissan yeah. micros for me. No, and, uh, and and maybe we should just uh, take it a little bit back because obviously I know a lot about why I say that and people who listen to especially the first season of your, your podcast, Far From Home, know what I'm talking about. So I drove a Nissan Micro, which is a little tiny stick shift car, if people don't know, a little hatchback, um, all across Europe and Asia about five years ago. And it was not brand new. It was not. It was a used car, and it had a lot of problems. And I, I drove or managed to drive uh, 18,000 miles, which is uh, 29,000 kilometers, I believe, uh, from the UK to Mongolia and back in this little tiny car that constantly broke down. Um, and that's what I told the story of on, on the first season of my podcast. So, yeah, lots of car trouble. So I, I don't drive that kind of car on a regular basis. Yeah. And then uh, whenever I, I tell people uh, about your podcast, I, I always say you have to go back and start from the beginning because right. uh, that uh, that season was just so uh, amazing and uh, it, it really got me hooked on, on, on listening to it. But a ton of work as well, not only doing the drive, but after as well. Yes, yeah, it was a lot of uh, yeah preparation for that trip, and then and then putting my podcast season together. It was it was a lot of work, but it was kind of a once in a lifetime experience, um, and, and I was glad to share it with all my listeners. Mm. It's like the Beverly Hillbillies. It's not for the faint of heart. It's the adventure, isn't it? It's just the thing of pushing yourself to the absolute limit because I think it's going to take us out of our comfort zone but in a really good way. From language barriers to car trouble, getting horribly lost to paying bribes to shady traffic cops, it's been quite an amazing experience, and over the coming episodes, I'll be bringing all of you along with me for the ride. This was a clip from the intro of the podcast, Far From Home, where it takes us along on a trip from London to Mongolia in a tiny Nissan Micra. There are so many stories from that trip, 
and I ask Scott if some of them stand out. Oh, so many. Uh, visiting Iran as American tourists. It was myself and, and my brother and, and two British friends of ours. And, and just, yeah, you're getting to drive across Iran and, um, you know, the, the friendliness of the people there. Um, and uh, visiting, uh, I don't know, all the countries in Central Asia that, you know, we had never been to, that most people never go to, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, seeing Cappadocia in Turkey, which is really amazing. Cappadocia? Yeah, yeah, it's these uh, ancient, like, homes that are built, like, into caves where the people live, very scenic and beautiful, people go in hot air balloons every morning, that was really neat, Um Driving across Mongolia, which is a fascinating country, has the lowest population density of, of any country in the world. Yeah. Um, just vast open spaces, um, beautiful landscapes and scenery. Um, there was just so much to see, so many stories on that trip. It, it took about seven weeks uh, to drive the first 11,000 miles from the UK to Mongolia. So, yeah, I saw so much. And then on the way back, I drove across so- Siberia and got yeah, because, to Chernobyl. Because most people, yeah. once they get to Mongolia, they leave the car and then right. get on a plane <laughs> back to civilization. But you did something else. No, I decided to drive all the way back <laughs> for some crazy reason. I, I wanted to continue seeing more of the world and uh, gathering more stories for my podcast. But, that, but was was that just you or did your brother tag along as well? No, he, they all flew home. But I, I had a friend, my friend Donna, uh, who used to be my neighbor. Um, she's very adventurous and uh the last number of years she had actually been couch sur- uh, excuse me um house sitting around the world and she was actually in copenhagen at that time was was house sitting and and she flew out to siberia to meet me and the two of us uh drove back together so yeah mm, yeah and and i guess she thought okay he's he's done he's made it so far so what can possibly go wrong Well, and she's very adventurous, so she was up for anything, and uh, she was curious to see. She had been thinking about like taking the Trans Siberian Railway, so we, but we just went the same route basically, but by road. So she was curious to see that. So yeah. yeah. So did you do just as much from that part? No, there. I mean, Siberia. I don't know what I was expecting, but Siberia is not the most interesting place. I guess I should have been surprised. Um, (laughs) But I did get to go to Tuva, which is really fascinating. I took a Tuvan throat singing lesson. Yeah, I remember that episode. That the, you, you even trying to do the. <laughs> In one of the episodes from season two, Scott visits a remote Russian republic of Tuva to learn about the traditional instruments and the ancient art of throat singing. Mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, mm. Okay, so far, so good. I think I could handle this. Feeling confident in my abilities, we moved on to the next level. Take this More open. But then it started to get harder. You should make oh. Oh, oh. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> As you could hear, he even attempts throat singing himself. You can read more about this visit and see the photos and videos if you click the link in the episode notes of this episode or go to the radiovagabond.com. Yeah, it's a fascinating culture because Russia is such an enormous country and there's so many different regions with different cultures. This was a region, Tuva. It's not a place that many tourists go. It, you know, it was like a 12-hour trip each way out of the way to get there. Um, and it's a totally different culture. It's just north of Mongolia. So the people, you know, there's like they look like almost like they're Mongolian or Asian. They don't look Russian and they have their own language and culture and everything. So fascinating place. Yeah. How, how are you able to communicate? No, I mean, we always managed to find someone who spoke English. Um, I'm lucky that English is my mother tongue, and so it's like a world language. Like, you'll, you know, usually find someone somewhere. Um, But even in places where we couldn't find anyone who spoke English, obviously I couldn't do an interview, but, you know, you could manage to communicate basic things if you're broken down on the side of the road between Google Translate or hand signals or, you know, they'll know a word or two and you could kind of convey what you're trying to, you know, we need help, send a tow truck or whatever it is. Yeah. He only knew a bit of English, so his wife helped translate and tell his story. 
they were nomads and they used to live in the nomadic camp in the western Tuwa. They had yaks, uh, cows, uh, sheep, goats, and his grandfather sang throat singing. And Genia listened to his grandfather and he started to try to throat sing himself. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. And then after that, you've made obviously made more uh, episodes from other faraway places. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, so that was the first season of my podcast was that trip. Um, but ever since then, I've I've kept my show going and I've continued traveling and telling more fascinating stories from far away places from my travels around the world. So uh, several stories from when I was in. Peru and like met a medicine man who uh, we went kind of on this expedition to search for this star-shaped stone that supposedly had magical powers that he saw in a in a vision. Um, I've told stories from I don't know Cambodia, from uh, trying to think where else Chernobyl, as I said, from the trip back, from um, all sorts of places of Northern Ireland about the peace walls there. So uh, yeah, there's just so much of the world to see, and I'm very much looking forward to when the pandemic is over that I can travel some more and tell more stories. Yeah, because um, right now we're uh, in, in 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 the New York area, and and you you live in uh, Jersey, just uh, outside of here. So we're we're close to home. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The past couple of years, I guess now a year and a half, I have not been traveling. Um, And so, uh, yeah, I've been pretty much staying home and, uh, you know, finding adventures closer to home, But it, which is, I mean, I, I'm fortunate I live in the New York area, so there's so much here. There's so much diversity, so much, you know, so many places in, in New York City and, and the surrounding area that I haven't yet explored. I've been doing a lot of hiking, uh, a lot of cooking, you know, trying, you know, experiments in the kitchen with different ingredients from different parts of the world that I've never tried before. I've gotten into home brewing recently. I'm just like all kinds of pandemic experiments. So I'm definitely, even though I can't travel, I'm definitely keeping busy and, and keeping myself entertained. Here's a clip from one of the episodes in Peru where he met this medicine man he was talking about and attended a hallucinating healing ceremony, drinking ayahuasca, all while holding his microphone. <laughs> There was a single fluorescent light bulb hanging in the center of the room, which gave everything a cold and clinical look, hardly the comforting atmosphere you would hope for an experience like this. After his song ended, Lucho gave the bottle of ayahuasca a final shake and then offered me some. Just a little, I reminded him. Okay. He poured out about an ounce of it into his wooden cup, And I held it up to my nose. <laughs> Smells strong. Okay, here we go. Mm. Extremely bitter. Oof. Ugh. Okay. And in March 2020, uh, when the the pandemic really took off and the world was locking down. I just made my way to Cape Town. You were still here in, in New York and we were actually both signed up to be at Africa Burn, which is kind of the African or the South African Burning Man. Uh, and uh, we were chatting away about doing some, some traveling in Africa, but then that didn't happen and you've been here ever since. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I had had a whole big uh, trip planned And uh, I was actually planning on starting out in Morocco and then um, going to uh, I was going to do a story on a film festival in a refugee camp in the middle of the Sahara Desert in Algeria, which would have been really uh, fascinating. But obviously that got postponed because um, of COVID. And then I was going to fly to South Africa and go to Africa Burn and 
I was talking with you about maybe traveling around South Africa and maybe going to Lesotho or Swaziland or somewhere. But um, yeah, unfortunately, all that got canceled. But I hope hopefully I'll be able to reschedule it at some point and we'll be able to do some traveling and reporting together. Yeah. So what what is on your list? Uh, because I guess you have given some thoughts on where to go when the world opens up for real again yeah uh, i mean i definitely would love to do go to that film festival whenever that's rescheduled um there's oh there's so many places i'd like to go i really would like to explore more of south america um i still haven't been to buenos aires and i've heard wonderful things about it from so many people um and just travel more the only places in south america i've been so far are peru and ecuador i've heard good things about colombia there you know I, i still haven't been to panama i know you were there recently um so yes so many places i'd like to go and and you know i haven't been to the caucasus like georgia and armenia that's on my list um, i'm actually thinking of going there uh, early next year okay. in that area yeah. yeah i was hoping to go on the mongol rally that that big road trip i took a few years ago but unfortunately we just didn't have time but uh, for whatever reason the idea of georgia and armenia sounds intriguing to me so that's Yeah, that's on my list, and I don't know, maybe more of Southeast Asia. I haven't been to Vietnam yet. Um, yeah, there's and more of Africa. You know, um, there's so much I'd like to see. Yeah. Yeah. If travel is your passion, and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is. The Radio Vagabond Podcast. One of the cool things about making friends around the world is that they can show you stuff that you wouldn't normally visit. And by this time, we'd already been to a few places. Get ready to take notes if you plan to visit, or like me, revisit New York. Scott is about to share a list of unusual places to visit. So where are you taking me now? So... uh You've been to New York several times, and so uh, I figured I would show you some more of the local places or places that most tourists wouldn't visit. So uh, we've gotten out of Manhattan, and we're I'm showing you some interesting places in the outer boroughs. We're driving through Brooklyn right now, um, and I just showed you uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park and the neighborhood called Dumbo, which stands for Down Under the Manhattan Bridge Overpass, uh, kind of a trendy neighborhood there. There, um, and we walked through Brooklyn Heights and downtown Brooklyn. We went to the New York City Transit Museum, where uh, fascinating place. Yeah, yeah, they have old subway cars going back over the past century, um, and so you got to actually walk through some of these old subway cars. And, and it's made in the, in an old uh, the subway station, so yeah. an obvious place. Yeah. yeah, an old subway station. So yeah, so that was really cool. Um, and now we are driving to Williamsburg, which is kind of like a hipster neighborhood. Um, and we'll walk around there a bit. Um, and then I'm going to take you up to uh, the Queen's Museum of Art. It's the old uh, World's Fair grounds where in the 1960s, I think it was 1962, they had the World's Fair there. And there's the big, uh, I think they call it the Unisphere. It's a giant kind of globe statue thing that there's a... Um, big fountain there it's kind of iconic people may have seen it in pictures of new york and then in the queen's museum of art there's this thing that was built for the world's fair called the panorama it's a scale model of every building in every borough of new york city at at that time in the 1960s and it's super cool you could walk around it you know on these like balconies um and it's really impressive it's it's neat because it gives you a scale of a sense of the scale of the city of new york you see how tiny manhattan is how big brooklyn and queens and some of the other boroughs are and it's and it it kind of goes through cycles in the day it like gets it's dark and then the lights come on in the buildings and there's little airplanes taking off and landing from the airport. It, it's really neat. I think you'll enjoy that. In Brooklyn, we walk around a bit and visit a place with a lot of food trucks called Smørgesburg. As far as I know, that word comes from the Danish smørbrød. That's a traditional open-faced sandwich we have in Denmark. And that the Americans started saying it like the Swedish chef from the Muppet Show. Unfortunately, we didn't find any 
Danish smørbrød at Smørkesburg. Another thing we couldn't find was Scott's car. So Scott, what are we doing? <laughs> We're looking for my car. I forgot where I parked. <laughs> we'll find it. We simply could not remember where we parked it. After an hour of searching, Scott walked up to a police car and asked if they'd seen it. Between third and fourth, and I'm not finding it. It was a Toyota Prius. They were actually able to look up the license plates and could tell him that he went through a toll booth earlier that day. Yeah, Big Brother's watching. What are you able to see that you could see a whole record of? That's probably when I came into the city. But not where it is right now. So we continue the search. He's able to see my whole record of where I've driven from the, I guess... He asked, was I driving it at 9.52 this morning? Or he, I guess he could see when I came in through the tolls Whoa. in the tunnel. I'm not creepy. I really wasn't paying much attention to where we parked. But I did point in one direction and said that I felt it was that way. But Scott wasn't convinced. Uh, good, good thing we're not in Kazakhstan. Oh, you know what? I think I just figured out. Finally, something clicked for Scott. We're on north. Well, I, was looking, I know I parked between third and fourth. But we're looking at north, third and fourth, and I think it changes over to south up here. So I think that's where on between south, third and fourth, not north. So I remembered correctly, but the wrong direction. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Hopefully, and, we'll see. And, and I'm not, I'm not the guy who says I told you so. Uh, I was pointing in this direction. <laughs> no, you were pointing the other direction. No, 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 no. Well, <laughs> I'm just going by my memory, but I think my memory is correct, but just the wrong direction. <laughs> and soon after, we found it. We'll be right back. Life is short And there is so much to explore I won't let a second go to waste Yeah, time goes fast I better step it up now Take some chances, cut some ropes Ooh, ain't gonna wait much longer You can follow Palabo on his Facebook page. Join the conversation about traveling and being a digital nomad. You can also see pictures, videos, and stories that don't necessarily make it into the podcast. Simply search for the Radio Vagabond. Scott, now that uh, we've we found your car, I thought I'd ask you, did, did on, on the trip from London to Mongolia, did you have uh, any encounters with uh, the law enforcement there? Because we just spoke to a police officer... Oh yeah, um, in uh, well Tajikistan, for example, uh, there you know there's a lot of corruption in a lot of these countries and places like Central Asia, and uh, my brother and my my friends and I got pulled over by some traffic cops who actually aimed their radar gun at another car and then tried to say that it was us and that we were speeding and were demanding that we give them a hundred dollars. <laughs> And uh, it was. It took quite a while of talking to them. To we finally uh, got out of it and uh, managed to give them a bottle of vodka and get out of the situation. Oh, you, But, a bottle of vodka. Yeah, we. I mean, we were resisting for the longest time. We didn't want to give them anything because we don't want to feed into the corruption and bribery that's common in these countries. But uh, we were about to threaten, um, you know, calling the embassy which usually works in situations like that. And, you know, it just takes a lot of patience and, you know, you don't back down and keep fighting. And eventually we just wanted to get out of the situation, so we gave him some vodka. But I, I covertly recorded the whole encounter on tapes. So I have audio of the whole uh, encounter. So it was quite an interesting experience. Yeah. My brother and I walked over to ask Rosie what was going on. She insisted Jane wasn't speeding. The police are trying to scam us, and this is bollocks, she said. We just keep on playing dumb, yeah. and we keep on asking for a translator. And he got somebody on the telephone, but we didn't understand them. One of the officers handed my brother his cell phone and put it on speaker so we could all listen in to the person on the other end of the line. Hello? Wait, what? One hundred dollars, he repeated. We don't have. We do not have that. No. We do not have. We're 
tourists driving. We're students. Yeah, we're students. We're in university. <laughs> he laughed, clearly not believing us. I can't help you. I can't help you, he said. It was pretty clear this whole thing was a ruse. Hello. Hello. Hello, mister. Yes. They're telling me that if you don't pay, they'll take your documents and send them to the police station in Dushanbe, he warned. Sir, they're threatening us right now. We went around in circles like this for 15 or 20 minutes without making much progress. Rosie still thought that giving them cash was out of the question, but maybe, she figured, there was another form of currency they'd accept. She opened the trunk and rummaged through her suitcase, returning a moment later holding a bottle. You know and I know we're not speeding, okay? You give us the documents, I'll give you that, we go, okay? This is good vodka, we've been drinking this vodka. The guy in the phone was still listening in and he laughed. The police officers smiled but resisted, holding out hope that they could still strike a better deal. Oh, come on, we have not got a hundred dollars. We need to go there. You can hear more about what happened when they met the police in Tajikistan in episode 16 of Far From Home, season one. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And then uh, there were several instances like that. We were pulled over actually a couple times in uh, Kyrgyzstan as well, but they actually had legit speed cameras there, and I guess we really were speeding there. And they were super nice, and they managed to let us out of it. But, um, yeah. Yeah. And when you actually were speeding, you were patting the the, the Nissan saying, oh, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> we had another situation on the way back. My friend Donna and I were stopped in Kazakhstan. Um, the road signs in some of these countries are so bad. Um, there was some kind of, there was like a place where the road split. And so if you continued going straight, it like turned into a one way and we were supposed to go to the right. And we didn't realize that because there was like a little tiny sign, but not like right where it split. There wasn't an arrow saying bear to the right like I would be used to seeing back home. And so I guess we were for a, a brief distance going the wrong way. But, you know, there was like a gas station right there. We were going to get gas. But I guess there was like a traffic camera or something. So a little farther on down the road, like we got pulled over and this cop was threatening to take our driver's licenses and we'd have to go to Almaty, the capital, to like go to traffic court and everything, like as if we were going to fly back to Almaty to (laughs) go to traffic court. But uh, it took quite a while of, you know, negotiating and threatening to call the embassy before we finally got out of that. But that was kind of a stressful situation. But have have you ever felt that you were in danger, uh, that, okay, this could turn really bad? Not, like, serious danger. I mean, there's been situations in retrospect where maybe we took a little bit more chances than we should have. Um, In Iran, you know, I I mean, I didn't have a journalist visa, but I was doing some sort of journalism there, and I was, you know, recording interviews with people. And, yeah, there was one day just, like, walking through a city park in in Tehran, and I just, you know, walking with this guy we met, and I was just had out my recorder and walking along with him. And, um, I, you know, I was so absorbed in the interview, I wasn't really paying attention to my surroundings. And my brother was getting really nervous, and he later said to me that we walked right past some kind of military soldier or someone who was kind of looking at me. And, you know, I could have potentially gotten in really big trouble for being an undercover journalist in Iran. Like, I wasn't doing serious journalism about the government or anything. I was just interviewing local people, but... You know, they they sometimes they're paranoid in some of these places and they say you're a spy or something. Yeah. So that was probably a risk I should not have taken. Yeah, yeah like when, when I when I went to North Korea, I left all my microphones in, in my bag in, uh, in in China and uh, and recorded everything on my on my phone. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but I wouldn't I wouldn't think not to do that in Tehran. I did it in, in Iran. I had my microphones there. I. Uh, Iran, that was before I started the podcast, but I don't know if I would even think about it. Maybe it's not a, as big of a situation with you because you're Danish, and I feel like Americans are more likely to say you're spies. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. possibly. Yeah, we're, we're the good guys. <laughs> I, I think they just don't have any perceptions of Danes, probably. <laughs> oh, oh, well. 
I don't know. I came, I came, I came there right after the uh, the, the the Mohammed cartoon uh, oh, crisis, and, oh, and they were true. Danish, and that's uh, true. and uh, actually there were some people that asked me, "Are you afraid to be here because you're Danish?" And saying, "No, should I be?" Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I was. It was a good time when I was in Iran. That it was right after. It was while Obama was president, and the nuclear agreement had just been signed. So at that time, yeah. you know, people were thrilled to see us and very happy to meet Americans. Every time I speak to people who's been to Iran, they say that they they're, they're the nicest people. Yeah, definitely. Of all my travels everywhere I've been, and I've met a lot of nice people. Like Cubans are very friendly and eager to meet you. Alaskans are very nice, but Iran more than anywhere else, just this sense of Persian hospitality. You meet complete strangers, and with you start chatting with them, and within five minutes, they're you know they they're so thrilled to practice their English, and they want to invite you to come to their homes, come for tea, come for dinner, meet their families, stay with them. Like uh, incredibly warm. Yeah. That's all for this episode. Thank you so much to Scott Gurian for taking me around the New York area on this beautiful Saturday. I hope to team up with him later and do some traveling somewhere in the world. Remember to follow Far From Home wherever you listen to audio. Or go to farfromhomepodcast.org. This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels and guest houses and hostels around the world. Hotels25.com My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk Mook, mook, mook.